Welcome and hello. This is a video tutorial in HECRAS. And in this lesson, I'm going to be discussing RAS Mapper, specifically editing the geometry for storage areas and 2D flow areas. What I have on the screen here is the RAS Mapper user's manual. This is the page for storage areas. And this right here is the page for the 2D flow areas. I will leave a link to both of these pages in the description of the video in case you're curious to read everything it has to say. All right, what I have on the screen now is my heck RAS, my main file GUI up at the top, as well as the RAS Mapper window down below. You can open up the RAS Mapper just by going up to GIS Tools, RAS Mapper. So here is the terrain I already have loaded in along with a projection right here. And let's go ahead and get started. So first I'm gonna talk about the storage areas and then after that, the 2D flow areas. Uh, before I can do anything, I need to actually create a geometry. So I'll just uh, call it geometry one and then click OK. And all right, that's fine. Let's go ahead and edit the geometry. So right click edit geometry. And now I have all of my features that I can edit. What we're going to be looking at here is storage areas and 2D flow areas. So let's start with storage areas. I'll go right click and uh, OK, so I'm already editing. Storage areas are used in HECRAS to model areas with horizontal water surfaces. Storage areas are defined by the boundaries of a polygon. So with storage areas selected here and then adding a new feature, I'm going to go ahead and hold down the shift button and then left mouse to pan around and find a good location. OK, this is not a good location, but I'm going to put it here anyway. So um, I'm not holding down the shift key anymore and I've got uh, selected. So I'm just going to single left click to outline this storage area right here. And then when I'm ready for my final point, I'll just double click storage area one. I could just call it that or call it like, you know, the name of a lake or whatever the storage area name actually is in reality and then click OK. And then what I could do is right click layer properties. So this is where I could define the symbology of that storage area. If I want to make it look a little different, I could change the color to maybe a darker blue. That's the line. And then the area right here, I can maybe change that to uh, let, yeah, the dark blue is again, but uh, maybe a little bit less transparent. Okay. Okay. Let's see what that looks like. Not good. Actually, hold on. If I save it, it might look a little bit better. Okay. Yeah, that looks fine for a storage area. It's just when it's selected, it looks more purple than blue. All right, I'm going to go back to edit mode. So here's the edit pencil. I have, I'm on add mode, so I could sketch another storage area if I want. But what I'm going to do is click on edit feature, select the storage area we just created, and then right click, compute elevation volume data. I'm going to save this geometry, click OK, or say yes. Then I'm actually going to close RAS Mapper, go over to the generic geometric data editor. I'm going to go file, open the geometry. This is geometry one. OK, here is my storage area. It's the only feature that I've added to the geometry so far Then I could single left click and edit storage area. And oh, yeah, it looks like that data has been added. OK, I guess I just didn't realize that it was added because I didn't see this table over in RAS Mapper. I was going to go ahead and manually add some data, but it looks like it's been done for us. So that's great. Looks like the invert of that storage area is 53.567. And then as the elevation increases to 228, so does the um, volume in acre feet. That's, that's a little bit higher than I expected to see there. Okay. Anyway, well, the, uh, the plot, I can also look at the plot by clicking on this button. And we have the volume in acre feet plotted against the elevation right here. Okay. And then here's the table data again, if I wanted that. All right, let's go ahead and uh, return back to RAS Mapper. So I'll close the geometric data editor, GIS tools, RAS Mapper. Next, I'm ready to talk about the 2D flow areas. And this is probably a little bit more powerful. This is why we use RAS Mapper because we want to take advantage of the 2D capabilities of HECRAS. So let's go ahead and select the geometry, click on the edit pencil, and then just below storage areas, we have 2D flow areas. The 2D flow areas are edited by editing the sub elements. So if I click the plus button here to expand, we have perimeters computation points, break lines, and refinement regions. The order of operations for creating and editing 2D flow areas are as follows. First of all, go ahead and add a perimeter. That's this first step here. Then we create a mesh. 
That involves entering the dx and dy values for the cell sizes or the, the distances between computation points. Then we generate the cell points. And then after that, we can do some post-processing, like adding additional adjustments by points, break lines, or refinement regions. So that's what we're going to talk about here as we go through each of these steps. I'm going to pretend like right here is a 2D flow area. So I'm going to start by sketching out the perimeter of that 2D flow area. All right, so I'm already editing. I have perimeter selected, and I've got my Add New Feature button selected right here. So I'm just going to single left click to begin my polygon or my uh, area. Yeah, polygon. And then I will do a double click to finish it up. It's called Perimeter 1. I could give it a different name, but I'll just use that name. So I'll go ahead and click OK. Now what it does is it automatically opens up this dialog box. This is the 2D flow area editor. This is the tool we'll use to specify the DX and the DY, the spacing between computation points, as it says right here, as well as click this button to generate the computation points and hence the mesh. I'm going to pull this off to the side here. And then so down in the bottom right, I see that my scale is one mile and that's about an inch on my screen. So I would say maybe this is about two miles wide and then maybe maybe two miles tall as or north and south as well. So we'll, we'll say 10,000 feet. So for my DX, maybe I want spacing every 2,000 feet. Looks like it's going to be force a square grid by making the DX and the DY the same. I'm just trying to think of how many cells I want. And I think that would give me maybe 50 cells or maybe not quite that many. I'm just going to go ahead and click this generate computation points button. OK, not 50. <laughs> Let me go ahead and change that maybe to 1000 and then click on generate computation points. That only gave me nine um, cells, so this should give me about four times as many. I'll click generate computation points. So what it's asking me here, it's just confirming, am I sure I want to replace the existing selection of DXDY2000? Yes, and boom, now we have, uh, looks like 41 different cells. This is the mesh that's been created by selecting the computation points. This process creates a computational mesh based on a grid and a set of cell sizes, those DX and DY values. The actual points, the locations of the X and Y values are shown right here. If I click this box for X and Y values, this is the northing and I'm sorry, the, the easting and the northing respectively for the X and the Y columns in this table. And this all refers to and is referenced to the datum that is associated with this uh, terrain, the, the reference system. So that is in project. Oops, I guess I have to close this real quick. That is in project, set projection, and I'm using NAD83 for California Zone 3. Okay, so this actually was a big hang up for me when I was preparing for this lesson and learning it for the first time. So if you're using a coordinate system that has uses latitude and longitude, you're going to be in a world of hurt because I didn't even realize that until I saw my scale, which was not one mile across, but the same scale was probably 0 0.009 something uh, latitude, uh, degrees. So when I put in a cell size of 500 feet or 1000 feet, then it was giving me errors. So I would strongly recommend that you're using northing and easting and that your scale right here shows, uh, yeah, miles or if I zoom in, it'll show me feet. Yep, so there's feet right there. If you don't see this scale on your screen, that's not a problem. You can go up to Tools, Options. Under Project Settings, General, this is the default page, I believe. The scale bar right here, just go ahead and check that checkbox on. Click OK, and then you should see a scale bar somewhere within your RAS Mapper map display. All right, so that is how to create the perimeter for your 2D flow area. The next editable feature down within 2D flow areas is the computation points. So if I select computation points and then I can either add or edit existing points, let's go ahead and just click on edit existing points, edit feature, and then I'm going to zoom in and just select the feature. And if I move that feature, say I want to move it over to the side, notice that the cell boundaries automatically update. And then I can go ahead and maybe move this cell boundary right here so that adjacent cells are bisected by a perpendicular or orthogonal line. That's the uh, word the user's manual uses. If I wanted to add a new computation point, I could do that as well. I still have computation point layer selected, but instead of edit, I'm going to add. So I'll click on the add mode. 
And maybe I think that this cell is too large. I'll add a computation point right here. Boom. And then look at that. The cell walls have been updated or the boundaries between the cells. I can add another one there, another one there, another one there, and so on. If I don't like what I just did, I could recompute the original grid by going back to um, parameters. No, 2D flow area. We can just right click and then 2D flow area editor. It brings me back here and I could just generate computation points, say yes, I want to um, overwrite what I had before, and then I'm back to where I started. So the computation points are important. They are used to generate the 2D flow area meshes. Next up is the break lines. That's this layer here within 2D flow areas. Break lines is a set of polylines used to enforce cell faces along linear features, such as high grounds, and it's also to direct water. I'm going to go ahead and add a break line. So I'm just going to sketch it in. This is a line feature. I'll start and just kind of, I don't know, start right here and then make the line go like that. Double click to end the break line. Give the break line a name. I'll just call it break line one. That's fine. And then click OK. Right now, nothing's happened because I haven't saved it. I believe I have to save and yes. So what it's done so far is it's just broken up the existing cells so that uh, the break line is now a boundary. But the break line itself has not been enforced. So if I click on break line, I click on edit, and then I click on this edit tool here, edit feature. And then I'm going to select the break line and then right click, enforce break line. And boom, what, what happened there was the mesh has recomputed based on that break line. The same uh, context menu features when you right click on the break line, which is edit properties, enforce break line, and rename are the same values right here. Oops. Yeah, are the same values right here, edit, enforce, and uh, compute. Oh, and we can also toggle on terrain contours. So here, terrain contours, it looks like to the nearest 5 feet or 10 feet or 20 feet. Sometimes it's nice to kind of see the, the terrain contours at the same time you're sketching in and working with these 2D flow areas. The break line itself has a number of properties. So if I wanted to right click and then edit break line properties, I only have one break line so far, so that's why I have one row in this table. The first column is the name, so that just needs to be a unique name for that break line. The next column over is near spacing. This is the distance to add computation points along the break line located at half the distance from this near spacing distance to the line on each side. So keep in mind, I used 1,000 feet for my original spacing between uh, the computation points. So for near spacing, if I wanted to, say, make it 500, then that means along the break line, I'm going to have a computation point every 500 feet, and it's going to be located 250 feet, just half of that near spacing distance from the line itself on both sides of the line. So if I said that right, and this works, if I click OK, OK, it appears nothing happens. I think I have to click and reinforce or enforce break line. Boom. So now the enforcement happened. And I think that's correct. Uh, the spacing between these computation points is 500. And then the distance between the computation point and the break line is 250. The reason you may want to do that is you may need to see some extra detail along the break line. And I could have made that even more severe. So for instance, if I went to edit break line properties and we changed it from 500 to maybe 200 and then we'll click OK and then let me click enforce this button here also enforces it right so now we have much closer spacing much more detail and smaller computation uh, cells or computation points that are more closely spaced or more calculations closer to that break line also the size of the cell and distance between computation points doubles with each layer from that break line until the original cell spacing of what I used was 1,000 feet between computation points is reassumed. OK, let's go back to that attribute table. The near repeats column right here, this is the number of times that near spacing will be used before the doubling of previous spacing begins. And then far spacing right here, this is how large a distance to go when adding points away from the line. And lastly, the checkbox right here, enforce one cell protection radius. This is a protective region buffered around the break line that extends by the near spacing distance on each side. So there's a lot of extra features that you can use to add points and modify points around the break lines based on uh, this table right here. 
Okay, so I'm going to click OK and then Enforce. The last feature within 2D flow areas here is refinement regions. Refinement regions are used to increase the computation point density or decrease the computation point density in an area where you would like either more or less detail results due to changes in the terrain or water surface elevation, or to simplify an area where the water surface elevation will not change as much. So let me go ahead and move to a different location within my 2D flow area to demonstrate the refinement regions. I'll go ahead and select refinement regions, add. Now what I'm going to be doing is sketching out a polygon, which is the refinement region within this 2D flow area. So I'll just go ahead and add it up here. Okay, and then double click to terminate. Just call it region one, that's fine, or you can type in whatever name you want, and then click OK. All right, now we're ready to make some edits. So if I click on the edit tool, highlight that region one, and then right click. Here are the, the options from the context menu. It's edit refinement regions. This is the one we're going to be looking at here. So we'll give it a name. We already we can change the name if we want. Cell size X and cell size Y. This refers to the spacing distance in X and Y directions for adding computation points inside the refinement region. So for instance, uh, if our spacing right now is 1000 feet and I wanted it to be more dense, I could go ahead and change this to a smaller number. Let's stick with, uh, how about 400 in both the X and Y direction. And then I'll click OK. And then right click and force region. Now we're looking at more dense computation points and smaller cell sizes within this particular region. And as you notice that the mesh also updated outside of the region to enforce that, that boundary. If we wanted to go the opposite direction and say that there's less detail required, we can go ahead and edit. Instead of a thousand, we need to make this a number larger than a thousand. So how about I'll just add a one to the front of the number, making it 1400, right click, and I believe this is enforce. Yeah, so this button right here is to enforce. And now the computation points are further spaced apart with larger cell sizes. All right, if I go back to that edit, we have uh, perimeter spacing. This right here is the distance to add computation points along the perimeter of the region. If it's left blank, then it's just going to use the default value for X right here. So let me go ahead and um, set this to a smaller number, maybe 600, and then click OK and then enforce. Maybe, let, me, let me go ahead and change that to a smaller number because I think it's hard to see what it was actually doing there. About 300, and then click OK, and then enforce. Okay, I guess that's it. We have a smaller cell spacing along the edge of the perimeter and then larger on the inside. The, the area in the inside is gonna be closer to the original X, Y values, and the perimeter spacing is the spacing along the perimeter. All right, well, that was it. For this lesson in HECRAS, we talked about RAS Mapper. After creating a ge geometry, we edited a storage area and computed the volume versus elevation. Then we created a 2D flow area over here, and we created a perimeter, computation points, break lines, and refinement regions.